Oh, hi. I didn't even see you there. Everything bothers him. He's unbothered. He calls it unbothered, but that's what's cute, because everything bothers him. He's bothered. I'm a botherina. What's up, everybody? Ty Rivera here, the absolute best LGBTQ comedian in the world. Welcome to yet another episode of Unbothered by Ty Rivera. That's right, it's Unbothered by Ty Rivera. I'm your host, Ty Rivera. We already went through that part. It's going to start this episode off like we start off every episode, and that's by summoning the spirit of Snoopy Bijou, the most unbothered energy in the world. You know, I still miss my Snoopy Bijou. I would like to lie to you guys and be like, I don't really feel anything, or it's just, you know, it's just one of those things. Let me straighten this out. This is why I really miss her, because she was my producer. And usually she was in charge of this and she would make sure everything was set up. And then all I had to do was plug and play, basically. Let's move this down a little bit so you can capture a little more of my beauty. Um, but yeah, I miss my baby a lot. But um, this is that time of year anyway, you know, that for me, that's what it is. Because, um, there, okay, there's a song that I really like that you guys may or may not have heard of, but it's by Dolly Parton and it's called the grass is blue. And, um, I just realized literally tonight and that's part of why I'm recording right now. Cause you know, some weeks I'll record this, uh, my, my podcast and some weeks I won't. And it just depends on, how busy my life is and where I am mentally, you know? Um, Because most of the time I'm pretty okay mentally, but there are times where I'm just like, yeah, I think I'm a little too emotional. And I think that that's something that just for me has come with age. Because when I was younger, I never used to get emotional. Well, you know, once in a while I'd have like a, a moment where I'd be emotional. But as I've gotten older, I've noticed that I'm a lot more emotional. And it's also like I told you guys, you know, I'm very much an empath and I don't really do anything anymore. Like, I'm not going to lie to you guys ever and be like, I never smoke. Obviously, I smoke cigarettes, but the wacky tobacco, um, I probably smoked that like two weeks ago and it was just like a couple quick puffs off of a friend that when I was performing with Leonardo, one of their friends, uh, I was outside of the club and I was done performing and he was like, do you want to take a dragon? So I hit it a couple of times and, um, but you know, it's, it's one of those things where I'm in my sober state of mind so much and like so many people in the world right now, including myself to a degree, uh, I guess, have a heavy energy. And so that's a big part of why I stay away from people for right now is because I feel like I'm almost too sensitive and too in tuned. And when I was at, you know, going out all the time, like performing all the time here in Austin and I'd be at creek and that kind of stuff it wasn't uncommon for me to smoke then like and it would you know be pretty much sometimes nightly and then sometimes just a couple of times a week depending on the week and I was always around people and I think that really did provide me with like a good filter between me and people because I was able to kind of tune out and not really like focus in on them and I'm very well known for not paying attention when people are talking to me, which is also a little bit of a defense mechanism. I know people are always going to hit me with something I don't care about or I don't want to hear. And I keep a lot of stuff to myself. And that sounds weird because my podcast is me talking all about me. But it, I keep a lot more of myself when I'm in person. Like this is kind of one of the only places that I do this because – if I talk to my friends, you know, the few friends that I actually do talk to, 
I'll talk to them about things, but mainly I listen to people and I, I mean, like I'll talk, but I don't usually like vent a lot or share a lot unless it's just something stupid like you know there was this dumb lady at the grocery store today or that kind of stuff i'll say that but anyway my point is um this time of year specifically is rough for me because for those of you who don't know the history i say it every year and i'll say it every year that i ever do a podcast just because it's what happens in my life around this time of year. And this year, it's been able to stay at bay until literally just today that I felt it. But on October 31st, or between October 31st and November 1st, my sister died. And so, you know, and she was my best friend and also my worst enemy at different points. But it's really hard for me not to get down this time of year and not to want to be around people and like even under like the best circumstances, you know, where I'm like really doing a lot of stuff like last year and every year it's like I kind of block out what I even do on Halloween because, you know, it's, it's a very particular feeling. And I don't know what would be worse. I don't know if it would be worse to have it be some random day or if it's worse this way where it's a holiday that people celebrate. Because, you know, uh, that's that's a thing, you know, because you'll be down because you remember. And boy, do I ever remember because the night before, which was Halloween night, you know, because like I said, it was between... October 31st and November 1st that she died. It's like the early morning hours, I think, uh, was, I mean, I, I never looked into any of the, you know, there was an autopsy done and that stuff, which, uh, you know, I shouldn't even talk about just because uh, like, I just, it gets me on the edge, you know what I mean? Like on the edge of just like losing it or getting very sad, you know, like, um, but I never bothered looking at any of that stuff. I don't know any of the details. I just know that it happened between those hours, uh, you know, overnight. And so, but I was, you know, still young at the time. And, you know, not young, like club young. <laughs> And so I was still going out all the time and really living my best gay life. And I remember that I had gone out on a date with this guy. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't a date. It was like, okay, there was this guy. I used to go to this club. It was called Paco Paco and it was a Latino club and it was a Latino gay club. And there was this guy that I really thought was so cute. Uh, I really did think he was so cute. And apparently he thought I was cute too. And so we would always just stare at each other on the dance floor. Because at that time I would dance all the time. Now I'll dance, but just like not all the time, you know. Um, Older women, older women, got to watch the joints. (laughs) But not, you know, (laughs) yeah, no, (laughs) I can still do what I need to do. But um, I just, I, I don't dance as often, which maybe is a problem. Maybe I should start dancing at home. I used to dance for Bijou. I, I used to, um, I used to put on quite a show for her in Vegas. I would really dance for her, which reminds me of my sister, you know, cause, um, I remember when my niece was little, uh, you know, uh, my sister's daughter and, uh, we had this big TV, a big screen TV, which was one of the old big screen TVs. But at the time, it was a brand new one. You know, it was a nice TV. It had doors on it so you could close it. You know what I mean? And my mom, she always loves having a nice TV or she always did. Now she doesn't really care too much about the TV downstairs. I think it was for us. She wanted us to feel like we had kind of movie theater type vibes and we did you know it was a big tv it was huge uh but my sister when my niece was a baby and i mean a baby like (laughs) probably two or three years old uh she would uh 
which I guess is a toddler, but the baby to me, you know, they're still babies at that time. And uh, she would turn on MTV. That's how old I am, is I remember when MTV still had music. And she would turn on MTV and she'd turn it up pretty loud and she would dance for my niece. And it was so hilarious because she would do like, you know, throw her hair around and throw herself against the wall. <laughs> and I remember my niece was a baby, like I said, a, a, a toddler at the time. And so she'd be either sitting in a little like not the bouncy chair, but the walker like that kind of thing. Or she'd be uh, like on the couch watching her mom dance. And uh, she'd be doing like a baby, you know, the baby would be like trying to dance with my sister. Uh, and it, it like, and that's what it reminded me of when I would do that with Bijou, you know? Um, it's weird how you like, you know, you think stories are benign sometimes, <laughs> but they'll just... Uh, I guess that was kind of, I should have expected that. Because <laughs> when you talk about two people that are gone, then obviously um, that's, uh, that's going to be a recipe for a lot of, uh, a lot of chances to uh, not be so happy, you know, because... But that's one of the things that makes me feel a little better, you know, because I still have a childish idea of heaven in my head. And so uh, I picture my my sister with Bijou. That's that's one of the things that makes me feel better, you know, because I'm like, I'm sure she's taking care of Bijou up there. Bijou is going to keep her, uh, going to keep her company, which she already has some of our other dogs to keep her company. <laughs> Every time a, di a dog dies in our family, we say, oh, go but to be with my sister. <laughs> my sister's just surrounded by dogs in heaven and probably mad right now. Um, but I'll get it together, you know, um, and also I kind of messed myself up a little bit today because um you know I still have Bijou's <laughs> her shrine which is really just her bed which I don't I don't think I'm ever it's like every once in a while I think like maybe I'll put it in my storage room but I don't really want to get rid of her spot you know because Bijou was so chill at the end well you know uh, like uh, for the last several years, like, we'd go for our walk, and then she'd go be by herself. Bijou was so cool about that, you know? Like, just, she wanted to be by herself a lot of times. And, like, she'd be in the room with me, too, but then still by herself, you know? And she'd come over and kiss me every once in a while or, you know, sit on my lap, that kind of stuff. So it wasn't like she was detached from me on any level. Um, but she was just very independent, so she'd, like be in her bed and messing with Mr. Bill, like humping him or, you know, that kind of stuff. And so I have her little box of ashes in her bed. And I went over there to do something. I don't remember what it was or what my excuse was for being over there. And I decided to pick up her box just to tell her I missed her. Because, you know, it's very common for me to see her bed and just be like, you know, hey, beige, or when I got a vacuum and I got to move it. But I used to do that with her when she was still here. Like, she'd be in her bed, and I just, you know, because I knew she wasn't going to jump out. She was so used to our rhythm that I would just pick up the bed, and I'd be like, I'm going to move you for a second, puppy, so I can vacuum. And so I would pick her up, and then I'd, you know, put her somewhere else, and then I'd do what I had to do and she would chill over there and then I'd pick her bed back up with her in it. And so I went over there and I picked up her box. And this might sound weird, but when I picked up her box, I really could feel her energy. Like it was, 
I'm not going to say it was strange because really it was just very comforting. But I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> that kind of wave of emotion, you know, when I picked it up, it was it was and I'm not trying to be overly dramatic. It wasn't like electric shock or like, you know, Ugh! it wasn't anything cheesy like that. It was just something I could really feel inside me when I picked it up, you know, and it was so I was a little bit overwhelmed with it. But I just, you know, I just went ahead and kissed her box. And then that sounds bad. <laughs> not in those terms. <laughs> but the actual box, you know, it's a wooden box. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> telling people you kissed your dog's box is disgusting. Um but, you know, uh, th there's a lot of stories where things are completely innocent and they sound bad. You know, like one time I posted on my Facebook about uh, because Bijou was in heat at a point and she had her little chonies and then her chonies, you know, had these pads that would stick inside them. And you know, I was her dad, so I would always take care of, you know, I'm not going to like... I'm not ever going to not take care of my baby. And so, like, I was very good about that with her. But her being a dog, sometimes I'd come home and she would have her 20s off. You know, she would have, like, figured out the Velcro or, like, somehow wormed her way out of her 20s. And uh, one time I was getting ready to leave and I was like, keep your 20s on for daddy, okay, baby? And I was like, that sounds creepy. But. You know, um, but yeah, so there, so there's that. But what I was thinking about, and I, this is kind of the point of everything for this episode and why I wanted to actually do it uh, was because I love that song, the or it's called Grass is Blue. I think it's just called Grass is Blue. It might be The Grass is Blue. Who knows? Who cares? You can, If you Google the glass is blue or you go on YouTube, that's even better. Just do the glass is blue and you can play it if you're not, the grass is blue. Sorry. Just play it and you can hear for yourself. But it's this song where Dolly Parton talks about having been in love with someone and they left or, you know, they broke up. They went their separate ways. And so what she does to keep herself from going crazy is she convinces herself that everything that's the opposite is true, you know? And so it's like, uh, you know, valleys are high and mountains are low, like that kind of thing. And so that's where the title comes from, where, you know, the sky is green and the grass is blue because you have to convince yourself that everything's opposite sometimes. Just so you don't go fucking crazy, you know? Um, and so I tell people all the time, like on, on days like this, you just have to really lie to yourself. And sometimes you have to lie to yourself every day for several weeks. You know, this is my, <laughs> my trick to staying alive. If there's anybody, maybe today is the day that I'm doing the, um, televangelist thing you know a couple weeks ago I said that with the uh with unbothered when I did the like live version of it that something was telling me that I should get on you know um and maybe today is that way or when this comes out maybe somebody will be uh in a rough spot somebody other than me right now um which don't worry about me I'm fine I just apparently had extra emotion that I had to humiliate myself with um but uh if anybody's fine if you find yourself having a hard time what works for me is just lying to yourself every day you know and you know you're lying to yourself most days you know as far as because you'll be having a hard time and sometimes it'll last a while you know and so you'll be like you just tell yourself tomorrow's gonna be fine tomorrow's gonna be great 
you know. And then you just keep telling yourself that every day, and then one day you'll not be lying to yourself. Like that's that's what happens, you know. Is you just have to keep lying to yourself until it finally becomes true, because eventually it does become true again. Because I don't feel like this all the time. I miss Bijou every day, at least a little bit, you know. There, like the longer I get away from when that happened, the. Uh, the more it, uh, like, the less I dwell on it, you know, but there will still be times when my mind completely gets taken over, you know, where it's just like, what if I had done this, or what if I had been able to do that, or what if I had done this sooner, or what if I had noticed this, or what about that one day where she made that sound, and I didn't know what it was, and I, I tried to figure it out, you know what I mean, because there was one day I always think about where, she just yelped out of nowhere, and it was when I when I picked her up, and it wasn't like I had, you know, it wasn't like I was in a hurry. It wasn't like you know there was any kind of situation where I picked her up any differently than I had picked her up any other time. And this was probably you know a couple of weeks before she started displaying any problems, or maybe a week before. But and so it was like you know just. Uh, like I picked her up and she made a, a yelp sound and I was like, you know, cause I would talk to her all the time, like a person, I was like, what's the matter puppy? And you know, I, I, um, but you know, there's a lot, uh, like not a lot, but moments like that, you know, like there was one time where like the day I took her to the emergency room the night before, I brought her to this chair with me so I could edit and I just wanted her to sit next to me because, you know, she had been hurting and I wanted her to be able to sit next to me. And so she was laying down next to me right here, you know, like right next to me because when I don't right now, I'm sitting cross legged crisscross applesauce is the way I'm sitting right now. Um, but she was sitting next to me. And there was a point where she was asleep next to me and she started running in her sleep. You know, she, well, it looked like she was running in her sleep. And I thought it was so cute because I thought, you know, she was, uh, I thought she was, uh, dreaming about running, you know, cause she'd been hurting for a while and she was still able to move at that time but not able to walk normally and that's what I had to keep her in the her confined area you know her doggy playpen and uh so I I remember you know her doing that and me thinking it was so cute because I was like she's remembering better times or you know hopefully preparing for better times ahead when she could run again um but now I look back on it and after watching different YouTube videos about different things, you know, because then I realized that she was probably having a seizure and I didn't know that that's what that was. I just thought it was her running in her sleep. And if I had known that that's what that was, maybe I could have shared that information, you know, because I told... The, I told the doctor at the emergency room the next day, but I don't know if the doctors were trying to save my feelings or they thought I was stupid or what it was. Cause I got, I get, that's one kind of, that's one complaint I think I have that, uh, and it's, it's, I'm not trying to bl victim blame or anything, but I think it's kind of my fault for doing all the stuff that I've done to myself as far as the piercing and the, the tattoos and stuff like that. Is people just don't, like medical professionals a lot of times, it seems, or people that are supposed to be in authoritative positions or people that are supposed to help you don't always take me seriously. It's almost like they think that I couldn't or thought that I couldn't have been capable of really feeling emotion towards this dog because of the way I looked, you know, like I, I just must be like a mean guy or something 
so it doesn't matter if my dog is dying, you know, or if I, you know, they just wouldn't, it's one of the big complaints and I'm not making a big thing of it. You know, I haven't chosen to make a big thing of it, but there are times when I want to go back to the vet because I thought the vet was being nice to me. Uh, Bijou's original vet here in town, you know, not the, the, emergency one obviously but I thought they were being nice to me in a way but really when I look back on it I was like they were actually very dismissive with me a lot of times and I try to watch myself because I know that I have a strong personality and I know that I can snap and so I I really do try to watch myself but I wish I had stood up more just for Bijou's sake because I thought you know like, they just didn't share enough information with me. Like, when I told her that, because I did tell her that when I was, you know, because like I said, that was literally the night before. And I remember telling her that. I was like, last night when she was asleep next to me, I had her, like, you know, next to me on the chair. And uh, she was running a place, and the doctor was just like, hmm. And that's all she said. But, you know, but she also told me that she could possibly have a brain tumor. And, it, it, like, she didn't tell me that, I ended up Googling and finding out because, you know, I read that when they have brain tumors, they'll get headaches. And uh, I was like, how do you know if a dog has a headache? And then I, you know, looked at, um, again, I feel like I get taken, like these things will take over my mind sometimes. And it'll be, you know, like it takes over my mind more than I want it to where it's like, 30 minutes or an hour of like not being able to focus on anything except for that moment in the past. You know, it's almost like taking yourself back there, like taking yourself back to that spot and just being like, like you almost wish you could just change, you know, like maybe that would have set off a sequence of events that would have got us back on the right track. Or, you know, if I had just, know that that's what that was and been able to say that so when i read about the fact that dogs know that you, one of the things dogs will do when they have a headache is they'll put their head on the ground you know and they'll like you know just sort of like they do when they're scent rolling and i thought she was scent rolling a couple of times when she had done that which again was towards the end of when she was able to walk you know when she started having problems and again, because I thought she was, uh, because I thought she was sent rolling or whatever, I remember her doing that, like putting her head down and, uh, but it's different when I think about it, you know, like, it's like, no, that was her touching her head to the ground. That wasn't sent rolling. I just had dismissed it as sent rolling because I didn't realize that could be, that would, I didn't, I never, it never even occurred to me that dogs have headaches, which I should know, but it never occurred to me, you know, but when, like when she, you know, like a good example is her, when she would go through heat, you know, like I would tell people all the time, you know, that I always knew when she was ready to go into heat because I always would tap her little booty, you know, like when she'd be sitting on my lap or she'd be next to me. And like, you know, a lot of times I would have my legs like, you know, when you cross your ankles and you're just like laying straight out or sitting straight out and up on the couch, I guess, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and she would sit like right in my lap, you know, between my legs. And I would always, like, tap her little booty, like, you know, when I just, you know, take a break from watching TV or whatever, and I just tap her a couple of times. And she would, uh, like, when it would get close to her cycle, I would tap her little booty, and she'd give me a look, sort of like, don't do that. And I always knew what that was. I'd always be like, okay, she's getting ready to go into heat, or she's in heat. And, uh, you know, and I always like respected her, you know, I like if she, if I knew she was hurting, if I knew she was going through anything, I always did whatever I could do to make it better. You know, if the, I made more chicken and rice than I ever thought I would make in my life. And like I told you guys, I would make her food. I would make her and Linden food at that time. And, uh, you know, like, 
Um, but what I was saying is that's happening less and less. So even though today is this day, uh, but also today, you know, is like I said, it's it, it and it, ha it like the thing with my sister, because <laughs> obviously this is just what this episode is. Uh, but the thing with my sister is every year it's gotten a little bit further like i ha it takes a little bit longer for me to be overtaken by the sad emotions you know because it used to be like the whole month of october and then it started getting a little bit more like uh you know two weeks out or three weeks out and like today that i'm recording this is the 29th and so we're two days away and like I knew it was coming up, you know, I knew the, the, the Halloween is coming up obviously. And I saw people over the weekend in their costumes, which is always a reminder. That's why I say, I don't know if it's better to just have it be a random day or have it be a holiday. Because for me, people being dressed up will like, trigger that memory that like oh yeah we're coming up to that day and my point was you know when it happened it was such a you know it's such a memory for me because th this guy I had taken him out on one date and we had you know hung out hung out like you know it was it was a successful day I'll put it that way and uh then we got to uh Halloween and that was going to be our second time really hanging out and so we were you know it was like we planned to meet at the club you know that's what we were going to do because I don't remember if he had to work or what it was but I was going to meet him at the club and so I ended up uh going to the club and we had a really great night together and then the next day that's when I woke up to that and so um you know, but it, it gets closer. And then I always like, but I always think of my sister. I think of her probably, you know, once a day, even though I don't brush my hair once a day, but it's because I still have this brush that's hers. And since I flat ironed my hair and this has like the hard bristles on it, you know, I don't know if it's boar bristle or what it is specifically, um, but it's, uh, you know, when I'm blow drying it, if I'm going to, flat iron and that kind of stuff then i'll use this so it pulls it straight and so uh i i have this which also is amazing to me because i remember us having this brush you know or her having this brush because it really was her brush um but i remember her having this brush when we were in las vegas the first time i ever lived in vegas which was when i was really young or you know um still in my teen years and so uh it's it's strange to have something that long that makes you think of you know which if you didn't catch the subtext of that story i stole that bitch's brush <laughs> I don't even remember how I ended up with it with it, but it really was her brush because she had this like, you know, really big hair. Uh, it was good hair and she would uh, she would have it relaxed because it was closer to the texture of black hair than it was to like white people hair. So like a perm really wasn't going to do any good for her. Now we all know how terrible relaxers are. I used to relax my hair for a long time, you know, which is the chemical straightening process that uh, would involve lye at different points. Like, you know, by the time I really got into relaxing my hair, a lot of things would advertise as being no lye relaxers. But now people are getting cancer from the lye. But lye used to... Um, Nothing used to straighten your hair out like lie, but you would know that you were doing damage to your hair at least or your scalp because when you would be done relaxing your hair, you know, like after you were done with the process, 
your scalp would be so raw and open. No matter what you did, your scalp would be so raw and open by the end, you know, by the end of the process that when you would spray hairspray on, you know, that night or whatever, because you'd style your hair. What I would do was I would relax my hair and then I would, <clears throat> you know, wash it all out and stuff like that. And then I would put on because you don't want to wash it for three days after. And that way it's like a perm, you know, like three Three days after, you don't really want to do anything with it. And so what I would do was I would put in gel and hairspray and enough so that it would like make it kind of plastic hair. And uh, then I could sleep on it and everything and not have it get messed up. And so I wouldn't have to wash or actually do my hair for three days. Sometimes it'd be as long as five days. I would wait just because for some reason I felt like that would help it really. I don't know what my thinking was. You know, you're stupid. You have We all have our processes for doing things where it's like, I wait this many days to do blah, blah, blah. Or I've noticed if I do. And so, you know, I would wait three to five days to wash my hair. And that was before I worked out like I do now. When I was younger, you know, I didn't really work out and I could eat anything I wanted and not gain weight and stuff like that. And so, um, you know, I, uh, I lived a chill lot, like, you know, where I could not wash my hair and not have it be like sweaty or gross or any of that kind of stuff. And so anyway, um, but my sister had this really big, but pretty hair and my mom used to call her Mufasa. <laughs> <laughs> my mom used to call her Mufasa, which obviously still makes me laugh to this day, you know, because <laughs> my mom's so matter of fact in her silly bitchiness. Like, and my mom really isn't like she's bitchy, but not really, you know, it's like she just has this funny way of doing everything. It's like my sense of humor is attributable to both of my parents, but in different ways, you know, because I have both of their traits when it comes to the sense of humor. Like my mom is really silly, even though like if you ever met her, which you never would because she doesn't meet anybody. But if you ever met her, she would be just chill and kind of on the like she'll say a silly thing here and there. She can't help herself, uh, she, but she won't full on be silly with strangers like she will with us at home. And she's so ridiculous that we have all sorts of things that we quote her about or like mannerisms that she has where she'll do her. Cause you know, like she loves doing a like, like a gesture, like she doesn't care. <laughs> and it'll be after her insulting you or after her doing something like, or you're just like mad at her, you know, or not even mad, just like, why would you say that? And she'll just be like, and that's her way of telling you, like, just deal with it. I don't care. Like, you know, and she will tell you that in so many words. She, but she says, I don't give which I haven't heard her tell me I don't give in a long time, but, you know, she would just leave it like that. She wouldn't say, I don't give an F. She wouldn't say, I don't give a damn. She wouldn't say anything. She'd just be like, I don't give. <laughs> like, and she really doesn't give. And so that's like, I guess, kind of her nonverbal, I don't give, is she would just like, and, uh, but, you know, it's one of the things that me and my sister and my niece will do with each other, you know, is where we'll just do it. <laughs> And my niece will be like, okay, Nana, or, you know, like, me and my sisters, when we do it, will be like, okay, Mom. But, uh, yeah, so my mom used to call her Mufasa, and, uh, like, my mom's so good at trolling that she does it. At a point, she stops. It stops being even a joke in her mind. It's just what she calls us, you know? Like, she'll literally tell me. Well, would literally tell me if my sister was alive. She'd be like, you know, be quiet, Mufasa, sleep on the couch right now. I'd just be like, Mufasa. Who she really trolls is my dad. And I, like, at this point, it is what it is, you know? But when I was younger, I used to get so annoyed with her because she like with him she literally does troll him and it would be because you know they've been married forever and so uh 
They've been, they've been married for like 50 years now or over 50 years now, I want to say. And uh, as I say in my joke, I haven't been around for all of it. For, so for anybody who's trying to say I'm 50, I am not. But uh, no, but they've been together for that for so long now. And uh, when I was younger, she, her and my dad would be fighting, you know, and it would be like, who knows who starts anything in a marriage? I'm sure it was both of them on different days. You know how it is when you're a kid. You come home. They've obviously been arguing. And my parents weren't physical. It wasn't like, you know, my dad ever hit my mom or anything like that. It would just be like fighting. You know, they'd be arguing. They wouldn't be getting along. And, uh, like, they would have been I, you know they would be at a standstill when I got home you know it'd be like quiet in the house but you can feel the tension you know of like <laughs> they're they're not acting normal or you know they're not addressing me normally I just have gotten home from school or out playing with my friends or that kind of thing usually out playing with my friends because you know my dad would have been at work and so by the time he gets home, I'm just wrapping up with my friends or I just finished hanging out with my friends, riding bikes or whatever. And, you know, I'd come home and it'd be quiet. And then uh, I'd go into the kitchen and my mom would be in there and my dad's like in the living room. So right within earshot and she'd be like, stay away from your dad. He's on the war path today. <laughs> it's like, OK, well. <laughs> I don't know why you're needling him right now, but that's probably not what it's <laughs> the best thing for. And usually my dad would just let it go, but every once in a while he would react to her and say something back, you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but my dad is is the most uh like he's the most let everything roll kind of person that I know, and I really do I'm getting closer to that the older I get, but I, I haven't quite achieved it yet, you know, but I don't know how he's done it all these years because he really is very even like people can tell and he's not at all a pushover and he's definitely not a weak man. He can assert himself when there's a reason to. But like from watching my dad, I think probably the most important lesson that I picked up from my dad non-verbally, you know, because there's a lot of lessons that my dad's taught me. Like I have a real dad, you know what I mean? Like I grew up with a like he had to work a lot. So when I say that my mom was in charge of raising me in a lot of ways, it's one of those two things can be true situations, you know, because there were it was me and my three sisters growing up. And then my mom and my mom was a housewife, but she was a real housewife. Like she would actually start shirts and, you know, uh, which I don't even see spray starch anymore. But she would like actually starch my dad's clothes, like his his shirts and his pants, you know, because he'd have sl slacks for work. And she would make sure all of our laundry was done all the time. We never had dirty faces. We weren't allowed to have dirty faces. And, you know, obviously when we're babies, we're and we were all like, you know, well, we were all relatively within like a couple years of each other, you know, and so. Uh, so she was in charge of us for a lot of and like she was in charge of everything and she didn't let us be dirty or let us, you know, like she she was even kind of. uh you could say anal about it, you know, like making sure that we didn't ever look, you know, we couldn't have Kool-Aid stain on our face. We had to go wash our face if that happened. Um, but, and she would cook, you know, like she would cook. Usually we wouldn't have breakfast. Well, we'd have maybe oatmeal or cereal for breakfast, but you know, it wasn't like she would make eggs and bacon usually, or that kind of thing, like on school days. But she would make us dinner every night. And when I was young, I remember her making me lunch a lot of times. And uh, but the house was always super clean. She's weird about the house to the point where the house will look clean to any normal person. But she still looks at it as dirty. Like she's just like, my house is a mess right now. And she's not pulling your leg and she's not just, you know, 
making something up in her head. She really does see it that way. And to this day, she's super active. She doesn't cook as much anymore. But I think because we all grew up, my dad and her, you know, I think it's a nonverbal agreement. I don't think they ever talked about it. But my dad, I think, was just sort of like, yeah, if you want to be done cooking, then be done cooking. We can get, you know. Because they don't go to restaurants every night. They're not those kinds of people. But they will order something or, you know, go. My dad will pick up some food. And plus, they're older. So they don't really eat like that anyway. You know, like older people don't really eat that much. And so it's not even like, you know, but, you know, and I guess sandwiches sometimes or whatever. But I can't really say, like, unless they're eating with us, I can't really say what they eat, you know, I don't really know, but all I know is that my mom doesn't have to cook anymore, but my point is, my mom was a real housewife, and not like you see on TV, where it's like they're shopping all the time, that kind of stuff, not that, she really was on top of us, and making sure that we were taken care of, and making sure my dad was taken care of, and everything at the house was taken care of, and then my dad made sure all the bills were taken care of. Like my mom never worked, you know, and it like you never worked outside of the home, I should say, because she worked. Like that's one thing I cannot stress enough. And when you know other people tell me that their mothers were housewives or stuff. I never look at that as like, oh, so your mom was lazy because I always picture and there are some lazy housewives out there, but I always picture somebody like my mom, you know, because my mom would even find stuff to do some days because, you know, she'd be done with all the regular chores. Um, and then she would like, you know, decide that she wanted to clean all of the blinds individually because the blinds look dusty and if she just went over them with the duster that's not really going to quite get it you know and so she would do stuff like that she would deep clean on you know on days where she, I guess she felt like she didn't have enough to do or whatever and then sometimes she would decide to air out the house which I always hated because we lived in Arizona it was so hot and it wasn't all the time, but she would decide sometimes like that she wanted to get the old air out of the house. And so she would open up all of the windows, obviously turn off the AC and open up all of the windows, you know, all of the doors except that had the screens on them because usually our doors had like security screens on them, not just regular screen doors. But so uh, she would open up all the doors and just like, let the house air out at the time. And I would hate those days so much because I'd just be like, ah, it's so hot right now. But anyway, my point is uh, when it comes to my dad, you know, when he was working, he was working, obviously, and he had to do that. But then when I would spend time with him or, you know, my mom would just leave us alone because sometimes my mom would, you know, go with the girls to the mall. My sisters take them to the mall or go watch a movie with them, you know, or just like there were different activities that they had to do. And my dad would always refer to it as like, you know, them like, you know. She, he'd refer to them as the women, you know, he'd tell me like, you know, you got to let the women have their time sometimes. I know because, you know, I was so used to being with my mom and my sisters that sometimes when my mom would want to leave me with my dad, I'd be like, why am I not going with you guys? I'm one of the girls. <laughs> you know, like, you're, and I didn't think that way, but I did think that way in a way where I was like, I'm with your crew. Why am I not going with the squad right now? Why am I staying home with him? And my dad would tell me, like, sometimes you got to let the women do their thing. You know, they, the women need to go do things and you stay home with me. You know, the men stay home together. And so uh, we were, you know, me and my dad would be hanging out and, and he would teach me a lot of things. You know, he would give me actual lessons or when we'd be out together because you know we had our activities we would do like I was very into WWF when I was a kid World Wrestling Federation like that Vince McMahon documentary that was on Netflix is really really good but it like reminded me a lot of my childhood you know because that was my me and my dad's thing like once a month or something like that WWF would come 
to Veteran, Veterans Memorial Coliseum, which at the time was our big venue in Phoenix. And even though we lived in Casa Grande, which was like 45 miles away, you know, or 45 minutes away, my mom was very cool about me and my dad because I guess that was our bonding time and my mom knew that and respected it. So my mom was very cool about not giving me or my dad a hard time when we would go watch wrestling together. And we would actually go watch it live and it was so cool. I got to see Hulk Hogan at a point. Uh, I've seen every professional wrestler, wrestler from the era when I was a kid. I saw all of them wrestle live and that's including like you know, all the legends, everything, because they used to come and it would be once a month. And there was this guy that me and my dad used to call the Tucson oldie because he was an older guy that was like a technical wrestler and he was from Tucson. And looking back on it now, they used to use him kind of as fill in matches. And a lot of times with some of the newer guys, you know, because he was you could tell he was technically good and he knew what he was doing, but probably had some life obligation that sidetracked him from living his dream and being one of the like legends, you know, when it came to pro wrestling from, cause he would have been the generation before. And, you know, wrestlers even to this day don't make as much money as they should make. It's like everything else in, well, a lot of other stuff when it comes to contact sports, which if you know wrestling, even though it's, uh, what's it called? Even though it is scripted, it's still, actual real physical contact there's no way to fake jumping off of something and onto somebody there's, there's a way that gravity just won't let you fake that so when people say wrestling is fake i agree when the wrestlers talk and i see them on interviews and they're like it's scripted but it's not fake if you get hit you get hit like that's the way you make it look real that's the way you make it sound real and when you're at those matches you really do get to see up close where you know, because they'd be doing the chops, which, you know, when they do the chops, they'll be smacking backwards like that. And you'll see the impact and you also see them getting redder or stuff like that. But, you know, my dad would also teach me things when we'd be out like that, you know, like interacting with people, like what it was about people that I kind of would want to be on the lookout for, you know, like this person. He taught me a lot about that kind of stuff where, um, you know, because I'm really good at navigating the streets and that is like one of the skills that I have that I think is very very valuable you know because I talk about that all the time and I don't think people understand to the degree uh, that I am able to navigate things until they hang out with me because like you know I've just hung out in so many dangerous situations and with so many shady characters at this point in my life that and like all of that stuff, like my ability to navigate that has always been like thanks to my dad, you know, because he did teach me so much about, you know, keeping my mouth shut at different points because people think I talk all the time and I do uh, about things that don't matter. But when it comes to me being around particular crowds, I know exactly when to keep my mouth shut. I know when to not say anything at all, not even a smart comment or me being funny comment or any. Sometimes it's just time to be completely quiet. You know, sometimes it's just time to be a fly on the wall. And sometimes you really didn't see anything. And my brain will block a lot of things out for me. And I'm like, I learned that from one conversation I had with my dad. And it was during the Iran Contra scandals, <laughs> which that's kind of dating myself, but I don't care, you know. Um, but I, Oliver North was being questioned. And I just kept, I remember he just kept saying, I don't recall, I don't recall, I don't recall. And I was told my dad, because I knew he, obviously he was in court. And I was like, I was like, why does he keep saying I don't recall? And then uh, my dad said, you know, because he's under oath. And if he says something that's untrue, then he's lying. But if you don't recall, then you just don't recall. Like nobody can make you remember something. If you don't remember it, you don't remember it. And so when I started really hanging out with shady characters, because I've hung out with shady characters on a level where they made so much money and I just never asked them what they did. And there have been times where I've 
you know, narrowly escaped. Because there was one guy that I had no idea the level he was operating at. I knew he was like popular in clubs, but I didn't know that. Yeah, and he liked me, you know, so <clears throat> he would want to hang out with me or, you know, he would offer me things when we were hanging out. And I was always like chill about it where I was like, mm, no, I don't really want anything, you know, because he would offer me like party favors and that kind of stuff. And I thought he was just a regular kind of just normal guy that maybe, you know, would every once in a while sell some, somebody something at a club or that kind of thing. But I didn't realize the level. And one time one of my friends said that he wanted to hook up on something. And I was like, I know this guy and I can introduce you guys. And like, you know, especially that kind of thing where it's like, I am not at all involved with it. I just introduce you and introduce you. And whatever you guys talk about or whatever you guys do has absolutely nothing to do with me. I don't want anything from either party. I know that there's probably going to be some money changing hands. But again, I was thinking like, you know, like low level type stuff, like, you know, like, what do I care? And also I wouldn't have cared even if I had known how much or whatever, but it like, it's me. I don't want to be, I don't want to know anything about it. You know what I mean? I don't need to hear any details or whatever. So anyway, what happened was one time I went out of town and then it turned out that that guy ended up getting busted and it ended up being one of the biggest busts in history for that particular thing. Um, and it was one of the biggest busts in Arizona history. And it was like, you know, um, but throughout my life, you know, like now I don't think I know any, I don't know what people do. Uh, and I do mean that honestly, like I said, um, so what I adopted from my dad telling me the, I recall, I don't recall thing, you know, why Oliver North d did that. I was like, well, if I never learn anything from what these people are doing, or I never ask any questions at all, then there's nothing for me to recall. So I don't even have to, you know, and if I ever see something, then I just don't have to see it, you know? And I do mean that where like, <clears throat> I've walked out of some rooms where <clears throat> I've just been like, you know, like you walk in and you notice something isn't right and then you just walk right back out and you don't actually take anything into your brain. You know what I mean? You're like, I'm not going to, I just like, you know, yeah, maybe somebody was like, you know, leaning over something or whatever, but I didn't like, as soon as I notice any kind of like red flag in the, the body posture or anything like that, I just immediately walk out. It's like, okay, I don't need to know what's happening in there. And like later on, I don't ask or anything like that. And I've, you know, that I've seen some famous people doing things or like haven't, like I said, haven't seen it. Just was like, you know, okay, that well, there was something off in that room. So I just like leave and mind my business, you know? And, but like, you know, um, but yeah, like I said, I don't think people understand the level because I think people just think, you know, like because I'm fun and stuff like that. And I am chill that, you know, it's it's all, you know, like that. And it is, you know, because that's the way everybody treats me, because that's the way I treat everything and everybody when it comes to that kind of stuff, you know, because if you let everybody know that you're just not a part of it, you know, you're just not, you don't care what they're all doing or whatever. You're just not a part of it. People will keep you out of it. You know, like every once in a while, you'll meet a person that like tries to force stuff on you as far as like, yeah, come do this and come check this out. And I tell people all the time, yeah, I don't want to go. I don't want to be a part of that. I don't like, you know, no, I'm not, I'm not going. So you guys do that, you know, but, um, but I learned all that stuff from, you know, just things my dad said to me. And, uh, even like I said, in the nonverbal and watching the way he would deal with people. And so, um, sometimes when people are like, you know, well, you, say things you shouldn't say or whatever. And I'm like, like what? Like about the way the comedy world works or people not being fair in that kind of situation or whatever. Um, Cause you know, I've talked openly about my situation with the mothership and that kind of stuff. And to me, that's not at all. I'm not going to pretend that that's anything on any level that should be a secret. You know, I'm not going to pretend like whatever, you know, like this is like, like, you know, street code or not snitching or whatever. It's like, what? Because I said that 
I was getting paid less than other people and that shouldn't happen. Well, that's just a professional situation that the only reason people don't want to want you to talk about that kind of stuff is because they don't want other people to realize that they may be getting cheated like you were or not cheated because I but you know, you're not being valued the same way that other people are, even though you're doing the same job or doing you know, sometimes better or more than the other people are. And that's the reason that people you want you to be quiet about that, because then they're not able to do what they did to you to the next person or they're less likely to be able to get a, get away with it. And so I won't ever believe that that's, you know, like that's should be treated with the same code as like other stuff where it's like, you know, OK, well, um, you know, and if it were anything that were ever like, you know, I've stopped SA in progress. Uh, like one time I was walking in a parking lot. I do a joke about it and uh, like that kind of stuff. I'm a little bit too much of a Boy Scout about, uh, you know, like I will admit that like I don't let things happen in front of me that I know are, you know, like physical things things with people you know um like that kind of stuff like I'm not allowing that like you know uh I could tell you that I would not have been a ditty party person you know like if I ever got invited to a ditty party I wouldn't have uh it, it's weird to think how you would have to handle that kind of situation because Obviously, a lot of people knew that things were going on. I shouldn't get into that because I probably will make a video about that at some point, like one of my regular channel videos about that. Excuse me. Because I know how those things happen for sure. But like that's a part of that's that's a part of what I say when I say that I don't want to be wrong because like certain adult activities like that when you get invited to certain parties or certain events and you know like that it's probably going to be wild in that kind of way I always tell people in those situations I wouldn't want to be there because I don't drink enough I'm not going to get caught up in the moment like you guys are and I'm going to end up being a witness or feeling bad about something so whatever you guys do you guys do I don't want to be there at all I don't want to be a part of any of that but yeah so I guess um to wrap my point up uh, to wrap my point up what I was trying to tell you guys and thank you for sticking with me because I know I got a little bit uh emotional there or whatever but um what I was trying to tell you guys is that um you, you do literally have to lie to yourself until things get better sometimes. And that doesn't just go for the sad times. You have to lie to yourself a lot because I haven't been the best about my eating lately. And it's just because if I don't eat things right now that are good to me, that taste good, then I'm just not going to eat. You know, I those are the two choices right now is to literally not eat or just eat less but stuff that I actually like. So if I want a soda, I'll have a soda and that will stop again very soon. But like I can't be on a strict diet right now because I literally won't like also strict diets. A lot of times do take quite a bit of preparation. And even though my life may seem chill or whatever, if you knew the amount of hours that I spend editing or doing the stuff that I actually have to do right now, you would understand that my life is probably uh, busier now than it was at any point when I was doing stand up because with stand up. Yeah, I have to be out of my place. And so I do have to be out in the world and at the comedy clubs and stuff like that. But it's usually like I work when I'm there and then after I leave, it's time for me to go. But with what I do now, because, you know, I'm doing the comedy coaching. If anybody's interested in comedy coaching, hit me up. Like I always say, it's not cheap, but it's good. Uh, <laughs> it'll be customized. It'll be very much what you need and not, you know, uh, not just something that I have where it's like, here's the book and you do this exercise and you do this exercise. No, it's very customized. And uh, but. You know, between that and editing and 
recording and you know then i have been making to the gym except for like the last three days haven't been gym days but it's because i had a couple of projects that were long that i had to work on and so uh but you know i like i don't have time to actually cook cook like today i made a grilled cheese sandwich and fries because you know the fries i can just put them in the air fryer the grilled cheese i had to pay a little bit of attention to but i also decided today was going to be like a self-care day and i think that's part of why i'm recording this as well is because today was just one of those days where i'm like okay i'm not gonna actually like i might do something after this like as far as record something and edit it and upload it but if i do it's going to be like a short thing but I told myself because, you know, I've been working really hard for the last, you know, several, several weeks now. I really have been. If you look at the amount of content I put out and even like, you know, short form for X or, you know, Facebook, Instagram, which Instagram I hate being on. But, you know, I will put stuff on there if I'm already doing that same stuff for X anyway. But I've been so busy lately that I can't be too picky about the way I'm eating and what I'm eating. I just have to make sure that I eat. And so, um, but like what, my, what I was trying to tell you about that and how lying to yourself applies to that too, is if you ever pay attention to me when I'm really watching my weight and I want to look super cut for like, you know, this year I'm not doing it, but like, you know, like Halloween is a time that I'll get cut a lot of times right before summer. I'll get in amazing shape a lot of times. And what I do is I will walk around with a lunch bag. I take my lunch. I take my food with me everywhere. And the way the lying to yourself applies to this is you will accidentally lie to yourself when you first buy your lunch bag. You'll some days forget to even pack your lunch. And then some days you'll pack your lunch and then you'll forget your lunch bag at home because you're not used to taking it. And this cycle, when I first started doing it, now I get better about it each time that I start it up again, where it's like a little more mess, muscle memory kicks in a little bit quicker. But when I first started doing it, I would forget my lunch on the counter more often than I would remember to take it with me. But I would lie to myself and I'd be like, tomorrow I'm going to remember to bring my lunch bag. And then I'd not remember it. And then eventually I would remember it and then I'd get in the habit of remembering it. And then before you know it, I'm remembering it more than I'm forgetting it. And then before you know it, I'm not even forgetting it at, at all. I'm doing it exactly the way, that the way that I'm supposed to. And to a point where like everything's going exactly the way that I want it to go, you know, because I am eating the way that I'm supposed to be eating and I am staying on my schedule the way that I'm supposed to stay on my schedule. Because a lot of times when you really are controlling your diet, which I'm not saying that this is the healthiest thing in the world, but it's just if you're going to live diet life and you want to like make sure that your, you know, your body looks a particular way or you get to a particular body fat percentage, because, you know, I've been as low as 6.8 percent body fat before and I don't quite want to be there anymore. Seven percent is good. Um, I had a friend that was at three and I know that I've gotten down low, like probably to like three to 5% before, but that was miserable. And it really was cause this is the dumbest thing ever, but I made it happen. It's one of my dreams in my life that I made happen. That was absolutely pointless and I don't know what I wanted to do it, but I wanted to see the, the, I wanted to see the scale at a point, say one, two, three. So I had to be 123 pounds in order to do that. And then I had a digital scale and this was another crazy one. I wanted to see it say one, two, three point four. And I was able to make that happen too. And somewhere I have uh, photo proof, you know, like in somewhere, uh, like maybe on my phone, like however many years ago or whatever. But yeah, somewhere uh, I do have, you know, uh, what's it called? If it didn't get lost in one of the hard drives, you know, cause I record so much content that sometimes that'll break my heart, you know, cause I have so much content even from like, you know, cause before it was the content like that, it was videos of me performing and I would just put it all on hard drives. You know, I would just clear off the memory stick and just put it, load it onto a hard drive. 
And then my hard drives, you know, uh, sometimes will burn out on me. And that's the worst feeling ever because, like, I'll try to send them to whatever doctor because I have – I always buy the um, – the what's it called for it? Um, the insurance. But sometimes even then they're just not able to rec recover it. They're not able to, like, you know, save the data. And so hopefully I didn't lose it there. But, yeah, so um, – so that's why you want to just continue lying to yourself because one day it will be true. You know, like I said, like I, you know, like I'm having a hard day, obviously. And, you know, maybe, you know, today me lying to myself will lead to tomorrow it being true. Maybe it won't. And maybe I'll just have to lie to myself again tomorrow. And then I'll lie to myself the next day. And I'll lie to myself the next day. And I'll lie to myself every day until that lie is the truth. And so, you know, it's good to lie to yourself every day about something, whether that's about the fact that you're going to be better with your diet or it's the fact that you're, you know, going to be more disciplined in your work or you're going to start whatever it is you're planning on starting. Whatever it is that you need to lie to yourself about, lie to yourself, but don't just lie to yourself. Lie to yourself with the intention of it being true, you know, where you really do just... I'm going to do it. I am going to do it. It may not look like I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. And like I said, it, like, you know, eventually you'll just train your mind. Your mind will be like, OK, well, guess what? We're doing it. And all of a sudden you'll be doing it. And I will before I get out of here, I'll tell you guys uh, when I did the like, hi, I didn't see you there thing. I just wanted to do that. There was no reason for it. I'm not actually reading. I wonder what this is. Let me see what this is in front of you guys, because I noticed that. This card is popping out. They're postcards, but I don't remember when I bought them. I was probably, you know what? This was when I was performing with Joe Coy. This is how long I've had this book because I was performing with Joe Coy in like 2013 and we went to Marco Island. That's one of the places that we performed. And uh, so there's Marco Island and then here's just a florida postcard they don't have anything on them they're just postcards that i have from uh that era you know because i haven't messed with this book in so long and the reason that i knew that it had something to do with joe coy is because his sister Gemma is the one that actually gave me this book she's his road manager now or that's what she was maybe she's his accountant now i don't know her job switches around She's so smart and so great and so just like a really loving person. I really do love Gemma, but she bought me the book, The Power of Now, and maybe I should start reading it because I've heard good things about it. Dan Coe talks about it, which if you're not familiar with Dan Coe, he talks about it. And so and I am going to get out of here. We're almost done with our time. So, you know, if you guys had enough of seeing me cry and want to get out of here before I cry again. Yeah, I would say this is the time to do it. But for those of you that want to finish out hearing what I'm going to say, let's see. This is Fashion Maven. And, oh, wow. This was 2010? So this was, yeah. My friend Elizabeth that I haven't talked to in forever. And what does this say? Uh... I know you say and I believe you that you don't expect people to go crazy over your birthday because you hate your birthday. But you deserve it, so I'm ashamed I only have this metaphorical peppermint stick to give you. Right now, somebody gave me a peppermint stick for, and I thought it was. I told her because we were such good friends at the time. I haven't talked to her in years, because uh, she stopped doing comedy at a point. But uh, and so you fall out of touch with people when that happens, and you're a comedian, you know. Um, but I remember somebody gave me a peppermint stick, and because we were friends, I would like, why would they give me a pep? What a weird gift to give me. And so we would always tease each other about peppermint stick, but. So, okay, so she was like, uh, so I only have this. So I sh I'm ashamed I only have this metaphorical peppermint stick to give you right now. I love you so much, and I'm so lucky you consider me a friend.
Happy birthday. Love always. Elizabeth, as well as short shorts, Cameron, Alex, Darth, and Darth Buttercup. Those are her cats. Well, short shorts is her boyfriend. <laughs> I, I don't know why I called him short shorts. It was it wasn't even like he ever wore short shorts and he was a big guy, you know. Um but yeah, maybe that's what we'll do as an exercise. This will be the what I lie to myself about. So, yeah, uh I'm going to read the power of now. So, that's what I'm going to lie to myself about. So, one day it'll be true that I'm actually reading the power of now. And thank you everybody for watching and thank you everybody for helping me get through my mini breakdown and i promise you i'll be good again while i'm uh and that could be me lying anyway stay unbothered